Good morning, everyone, and Merry Christmas. I don't know why it seems weird this year to say that. Is it kind of like maybe because we didn't have summer? <laughs> I'm still like three months behind or something. I, it just seems a bit odd. Morning also to our online. Thank you for being with us. For those that uh, looked at the roads, like uh, Ashley and Cheryl, and said uh, no. So we'll be seeing you later, or you'll be seeing us anyways. And uh, yeah, it's good to be together. It's good to have our online group as well that are able to meet and be with us and continue in the sermon series when they're not able to be together. Susan texted me just before uh, service began that uh, Charlie, who we know takes care of her, helps her out a lot, is going in for COVID testing today. So she's like, just in case, I'll be at home. So we pray that that turns out well and that that she's going to do okay, that she doesn't have COVID, he doesn't have COVID, and uh, be able to meet with us. So this week we are continuing in Being the Body. We're already up to number four to six in this series, talking about the parts of the body and, and how God uses them and being the body in the work of the church today. So what a wonderful time of year to think of the eternal and powerful God taking on flesh as a baby to dwell with us to lead the way from the cradle to the cross. Our series is Being the Body of Jesus in our communities, and this time we, this week we tie our message of Jesus coming in the flesh as a baby and as him taking on the body. God wrapped in flesh as our Emmanuel is the essence of the Christmas message. The eternal God taking on flesh and then using that body, living in that body, and what we read through the Gospels in the life that he lived. And now as we are the body of Christ from here, we model that, what started here in the manger. So far in the series, we've talked about being in the body. We looked at 1 Corinthians 12 as the body. And uh, we've been challenged to be which two parts of the body? Can you hear me? The two parts of the body that we've talked about so far are the ears and the eyes. Today we talk about hands. How are your hands different from the ears and your eyes? Do this with your ears. <laughs> the ears and the eyes are intended as input. Gathering information. How is that different from the hands? You get input, but you get output. What you can do with your hands is significantly different than what you can do with your ears, with your eyes. This is how we connect to the world by that expression. We can feel. We can certainly sense the world around us, but we participate in the world with our hands. You think you... You know, we've seen an x-ray. What's underneath your skin? How incredible are your hands? Well, there's an x-ray looking at the hand. Pretty incredible. Pretty amazing. And then the bottom one, there's your musculature. A few of your main nerves. You know, the diagram of what's underneath that skin. I mean, in this series, we're not even talking about skin, how incredible that is. But the hands, what you can do with your hands is impressive and how they can change through time. So some of the stats about our hands. Three main nerves running through, two major arteries, 27 bones, 34 muscles, 48 nerves. Look at the ligament count. It's not a typo, one, two, three. 123 ligaments to do that. More of the body is devoted to controlling the hands. That's the motor cortex part of the brain. A quarter of the motor cortex of the brain is dedicated just to your hands. It takes a quarter of your brain to do that. And you can do that without it interrupting your thought process, usually, until you're trying to screw a nut on. <laughs> then all of a sudden you blank. You maybe forget to breathe. But our hands... Did you see where the muscles are in the hands? They're not in the fingers. Your fingers have no muscles. 
We move our hands by remote control. All the muscles are here and here. So what's that? That's what I was researching. The little spongy parts? What's that? What is it, Faith? Ligaments. It's ligaments and fat. Little balls of impact fat so you can take pressure. Like shock absorbers. That's what fills the little pads. Why they're so sensitive. The hands are amazing. But what do you do with your hands? We're thinking about being the body of Jesus. When Jesus had his hands, what did he do? Dave? Blessings. Blessings. What else did he do? He healed, touched, healed with his hands. Held children. I was going to put that passage in, and the sermon was getting longer and longer and longer. <laughs> Don? Okay, lifted. He worked, right? Known as a carpenter. Touch. You require your hands. What do we like to do with our hands? I don't mind eating. How about the rest of you? It can kind of require hands. Unless it's Abby. Have you seen her eat a burrito? She doesn't lift the burrito. She stands it up and then goes. <laughs> so it doesn't take much. It's kind of a snake use. How do you use your hands to help others? Jennifer, anybody like a hug? Does that help? Yes. There's something about physical contact that is so important. How do you use your hands to help others? Serving often requires the use of our hands. That's, it's, that's our external way of connecting. How complicated would your life or church be without hands? This place wouldn't be very clean. The place wouldn't be very clean. How complicated would your life be? We couldn't turn our Bible pages. You couldn't turn your... <laughs> You ever had a sprained hand or a finger or a sling or a cast? That throws you off. But to think of being the body of Christ and no hands doesn't work. It, we can see, we can hear, but we're not engaged without the hands. But he came to be more than a baby, right? He didn't come to just sit in the manger. He came. He came. And he took on a body. And that body started as a baby. With little Jewish baby hands. I bet they were cute. I bet his parents loved them, wanted to be with them. You know? He came and he took on hands. It's Christmas time. We often see pictures of Jesus in the manger. With the, it's true. It's amazing part of the good news. And sometimes I need to remind myself of the manger part too. Because I think of him on the cross. But it started there. In the manger. He comes in the manger. And he comes out of Mary. That's how it happens. With ears, eyes, hands, heart, voice. And they were all used to serve God all used to connect to humanity in a way that God hadn't connected without flesh. Today we're going to look at the accounts of the touching. How people touched him and how he touched others. The baby in the manger comes with hands, skin, a voice to cry with. That encounter starts... You know, we have the Matthew and the Luke. We're looking at Luke, Luke 2, 1 to 40. We read of his hands and the hands of the first people to see him and touch him. We read of the birth of Jesus being held by his mother and likely, I'm going to say, held by his father. Not listed, but he bet he's in there. So while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. She wrapped him and placed him. Touch. God takes on flesh. And the first touch, not only in the carrying, is Mary, but the first touch 
is there. And into the manger he goes. The next group of people to come to him, the shepherds. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem to see the things that happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now it doesn't say that they touched him. I might have wanted to. I can just imagine them dirty shepherds coming up. Can I hold them? <laughs> you know, can I hold them? Can I see them? Really, the angels just spoke to us. That is the Messiah? Wow. And they go off and they tell the good news. And people are amazed at what the shepherds said to them. What happens a few days later? Right, Alan? If you want extensive notes on this, Alan did a men's breakfast devotional, Simeon and Anna. So we're at Luke 2, 25 through 40. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous, devout, he was waiting. Keep those words in mind. He was righteous, devout, and waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. A man filled with the Spirit. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. Now here is this senior, maybe, at the temple that just happens to be there that comes and takes the child and says what? What's Simeon's message from the Holy Spirit the first few days of Jesus' life? A stranger to them. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the, in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. That's our baby that he's talking about. That's Jesus. And he's holding him and he's saying this in the temple. They're just there for the dedication. But Simeon says these words. In verse 33, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. We're pretty good up to that part. He's going to change things. He's going to challenge things. He's going to challenge perspective. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. That's what the Spirit says through Simeon to his mother. You are in for something. He is going to change the world. And he's going to, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Part of his coming is the sacrifice. Warning that just that few days early, few days old, he gets this. And then Anna. There was a prophet or a prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phenuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. If you wonder in scripture what very old is, there's a number. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. What's very old? This is Jean. Very, very old. <laughs> I was very old a long time ago. What do we know about Anna? She never left the temple but worshipped night and day fasting and praying. Amen. Amen. What a dedication. I lost my husband, but what do I do? I go to the temple. I live at the temple. I stay at the temple. And what I do is I fast and I pray. Coming to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Happenstance, right? Coincidence. Anna just happens to walk by. No. No, God preparing even these strangers to welcome the Messiah, to touch him, to be with him, to share with 
others, to look forward to not just what was in the past, but what was in the future. And these people were, well, we don't know about Simeon so much, but we know Anna is very old. But it doesn't matter, because what is about to change is significant. Jesus is bringing a new everything. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee on their, to their own town in Nazareth. And the child grew. I wonder why it says the child. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. The first people, the first encounters of touch with Jesus are about expressing who he is, about celebrating what he has come to do. But as we know, much of that after this is just gone. We have, he comes to the temple at 12, and then we have the ministry. These are those first encounters, and they're recorded. We're going to skip way ahead, Mark 1, 40 to 42. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you're willing... You can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. <clears throat> A little trivia. How did God create the universe? He, he spoke. Did he have to touch this man? No. He didn't have to. What does it say to someone when you touch them? What does it say to a leper when you touch them? I'm not afraid. I see you. I acknowledge you. I appreciate you. And immediately, his leprosy was cured. Touch. Jesus used his hand. Mark 5, 23 through 24 through 34. In this section, a large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So she reached out in faith that he is who he said he was. But I don't want to disturb him. I just want to touch him. And if I just touch him, maybe that's enough. Her act of faith was rewarded by her healing and as we read the pronouncement of her healing, which would then restore her back to community. Mark continues to record Jesus' actions, so we pick up in Mark 6, 53 through 56. Jesus touching. When they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. So now they know what Jesus can do. So how do people respond? The same way that I would respond. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplace. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And don't skip the last. And all who touched him were healed. But if you knew that he was going to be in Armstrong, what are we going to do with your mom, Dave? We're going to get her there. We're going to get there. And we're going to get to the marketplace, and we're going to hope for the best spot. And we are going to get there because when you touch Jesus in faith, you're healed. And town after town this happens and the stories occur and they get there. They're like, oh, he, I don't know how long he's going to be there, but they get there so that they can touch him. Now their faith might not have been much more than that, but it is the power of touch. When Jesus touches, people change. Luke 7, 11 through 17 shows the impact of the widow of Nain. Let me just touch the coffin. What happens? Your son's returned. 
Luke 22, 47 through 51, records Jesus touching a situation where most people would only be thinking of themselves. He is arrested. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Malchus, his ear gets cut off. What does Jesus do? Touches it. Puts it back. Heals his ear. When he would be thinking about his own arrest, he still reaches out and touches. So why? Why? What motivates him to move his hands? The same thing that moves our hands. He saw and heard a need that he could do something about. He had a passion for people and wanted the best for them. He listened to what the Father wanted and that prompted him to action. But he used his eyes, he used his ears, he was involved, and then he used his hands. Because he cared. But he was also listening to his Father. It's the impact of compassion. What is compassion? The loving compassion of one person literally changed the life of another. For the person who cared for, the person who cared was moved to act and so to set the needy person on a new course in life. So whose life is on a different path because of your connection to them? That you've touched their life and changed direction. It's what the church does. Touch. We're called to be a helper. Who knows where these small acts will lead? Little things. What's important is that our faith is active. It's not just the eyes and the ears. It's the hands. Get involved. We need to be helping people hands-on, find practical, specific ways to help out. And I tell you, COVID has not helped us with that. It's hard to even help one another. People do not, do not often care how much you know until they know how much you care. So we have to find ways to show people, acknowledge that we do care, and find ways to help. For the last 18 years, because I've been part of the board that whole time, the last 18 years we used NeighborLink as our way to make connections. This year, NeighborLink, we shut down. So now we're taking phone calls directly to the church. But we're here to help to do what we can, and that's how we distribute the hampers that we have, a practical way to help people in need. And last week, we helped a family that called, and they were, like, in trouble. And so the, the food that we provided was a blessing. It was an opportunity to be an encouragement to them. But we have to have a way to do that. And so we find ways to connect. It's so natural to help, but to realize that our hands are a part of that. As you look back through your week, who did you help and why did you help them? Who has helped you and did you thank them for their hands and their help? This morning I was out shoveling the rest of the sidewalk because of Jason's plowing. Gordon pulls in, grabs his shovel. So what do we do? We shovel together and we talk because that's what we do. If he's out shoveling, well, I'll go out shoveling. It's just... That's what it takes. It's just be with people. Help where you can. Find ways to be a blessing. How have your hands been used for his glory? How will you use your hands this week? Did you shovel a walk? I did this before. Did you shovel a walk, make a phone call, help with groceries, give a hug? I like that last one because it helps both. But it takes her hands. It makes a difference. How do we become the hands of Jesus? Well, I'm not sure that we can if we don't turn our eyes and our ears over. Because it's not just about being busy, about using your hands. It's about listening to the Father and seeing opportunity and then putting that together. Baby Jesus learned to help with his hands. The discipline that he developed as a youth carried on and he helped others when he was older. We're thankful that he came and he slept in the manger. And I would have wanted to hold him. I would have wanted to comfort him. That's just who I am. Years later, about 33 of them, what does he do with his hands? He offers them on the cross so that in eternity he can comfort us. What a blessing that we'll have the hands of Jesus. He'll be there to comfort us. So this week, make a hands-on plan as a family and work together. Choose at least one action that places you hands-on with others. Host a meal, drop by for coffee, shovel someone's walk, write a card, do whatever comes in your way of, of compassion. And when you give God the glory, 
Let people know that you're helping because of Jesus. Ministering as a family is a real blessing. And how will it look in your life this week? We have lots of ways to help. But tie that because of our faith in what Jesus has done. We have our ears, we have our eyes, we have our hands. But it's the passion. Next week, the heart of Jesus. What did Jesus have a passion for? Do we have those as our passions so that they motivate, they interconnect the parts of the body? And after that, we look at what's our voice. So thank you for being here to, together today. Merry Christmas as you celebrate the coming of Jesus and think of the impact of his body then and ourselves as the impact of his body today.